I must say that this thing we call morality as it stands is a bunch of baloney. Morality at its core is just arbitrary distinctions that become established foundations that are then upheld for all the wrong reasons. For starters, there is no such thing as anything outside of the observation perspective that creates distinctions out of nothing, then solidifies the distinctions with concrete meanings. In other words, there is no such thing as up or down, evil and good, right and wrong, hot and cold, light and dark, or fast and slow, independent of the discriminating perspective that distinguishes these definitions. There is no such thing as Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, January, February, March, years, months, minutes, or seconds, but only a relative imagination of such things. The only reason these distinctions carry any weight is because one of the major utilities of imagined distinctions is that they can be shared or agreed upon. And this doesn't just apply to concepts, but also to objects as well. Fundamentally, there's only a spectrum of energy imagined by an awareness that is then given contrast and definition that translates into a distinct reality. There really is no inside or outside, but the imagined agreed upon shared distinction gives rise to the illusion of such. It is called illusion because the second distinctions are made, the process of separation begins. Of itself, this isn't necessarily an issue, for an illusion is harmless as long as one can recognize it. The complication arises from the identification with the distinctions of separated illusion. This is the delusion of illusion. So, for example, the imagined distinction of form comes into play and then becomes compounded by the imagined distinction of I am this form. In other words, only when awareness forgets that the constructs of the imagination are just products of the imagination does the delusion of illusion set in. So an illusion by itself is not an issue. Only when one gets caught up in illusion and becomes deluded by it does the issue arise. It's very much like the dreaming process. As long as one is unaware that they are dreaming, they are helplessly at the mercy of the dream, subject to be jostled around from paradise to nightmare without any control. They are as hapless as a leaf in the wind. Only when one becomes aware that they are dreaming while they are dreaming does the dream illusion become clear, which thereby facilitates control, creation, and responsibility. And it's important to note that becoming lucid in a dream can only be accomplished by you. The true awareness of the dream is only realized when it awakens within you. It doesn't matter if it was triggered by something else. The trigger is not the realization itself, but only an aspect that may or may not inspire the realization to unfold. This is why it is a complete error to look outside of oneself for proof of anything. Even if such proof was provided, it would not translate into realization. Experience of the realization is the only way to clear seeing. If one is dreaming and unaware of it, they might encounter a dream character who advises that it's just a dream. But this disclosure won't mean a thing without the realization and demands for proof won't lead to any clarity either, even if such proofs are presented. It seems kind of silly, doesn't it? A dreamer demanding that the dream prove itself a dream? Never does it ever happen this way. This is not what illusion does. The only proof illusion provides is proof that it is real, which inevitably sucks you deeper into delusion. This is what makes illusion illusion. Its function is to fool you, not reveal its designs. And all of this holds true, not just in dreams of sleep, but in the waking mundane material reality we call real life or awake. But the raw fact of the matter is that this state is the furthest thing from awake as possible. 
This is why it is so convincingly real and solidified. It is the ultimate delusion and the ultimate illusion. And of course this means that all of the concepts and objects of this domain are the same. Empty, unsubstantial projections of an imagination that are given concrete existence by overlooking their source. So what is the usefulness of concepts and illusion? Beyond reinforcement, they really have no use. The fact that they reinforce illusion means that they are actually counterproductive. The concept of morality is meaningless because it is much ado about nothing and put into practice for all the wrong intentions. The question really needs to be put forward. What is the purpose of your morals? To be good? For what reason exactly? To gain favor with God? To have good karma? To get back what you pay forward? To reduce suffering? As noble as many of these motivations seem, when you boil it down, they are but selfish motivations. In other words, delusional concepts based on delusions that only sink one deeper into delusion. It's also very self-important. We are not important or unimportant. We just are. Man's concept of a separate God watching over everything we do really assumes that man is somehow of supreme crucial importance. That's the real function of the concept, to put man on a pedestal. But since this God is but a mere inventory item of illusion, all it amounts to is delusional vanity. Trying to tweak one's karma is another waste of time. As long as one is lost in illusion, it really makes no difference what condition you're in. It's like if you are stricken with a deadly disease, does it really make a difference if you are wearing a tuxedo or dressed in rags? One idea is that certain states of karma more easily facilitate one to be exposed to the right people, circumstances, and wisdom to enable enlightenment from illusion. But it is highly unlikely that this is the actual case. The fact that so many of today's Buddhists and Hindus are wrapped up in attachments is evidence enough of this. And even when they address detachment, it's always with conditional exceptions. Like, we must detach except from God, or family, or good causes, or important teachings, or the quest for enlightenment. And further evidence is apparent in that so many of the so-called transcended enlightened masters and gurus are so obviously delusional fakes that only seek reverence and exaltation. The tools of enlightenment and freedom are always available to all men in all circumstances. It's just a matter of if man will recognize and employ them. There are no prerequisite conditions to enlightenment. It's not something only available to princes or lone monks living in the wilderness. Anyone can become enlightened in a blink of an eye. Even a depraved, psychotic, sociopathic serial killer sitting on death row with all his bad karma could become enlightened. Cause and effect only determine a condition. They don't determine enlightenment. And ultimately, the best karma is no karma at all. And this ties into producing good causes to receive good benefits. Pay it forward to get back tenfold, right? If we are in delusion, do benefits really play a helpful role? Oh, they may make things more comfortable, more happy, and more pleasurable. Who wouldn't want that? Not many. And that's the point. It equates into ignorance's bliss. The key is to recognize the illusion and break free from it, not to become lost in oblivion and complete comfort. 
A prisoner is still a prisoner, whether he is in a five-by-five five cell or in a luxurious mansion, replete with gadgets, toys, modern conveniences, entertainment, and steak and lobster for dinner every night. But that's just it. So many people wouldn't mind that deal and would jump at the chance to be a prisoner in a luxurious prison. It's unfortunate and just goes to show you how pleasure and comfort are actually more of a detriment than hardship and suffering. If something is lulling you into a false sense of complacency, security, and comfort and well-being, how can it be beneficial? There's an old Arabic curse. May you obtain everything you desire. This is something that is said to an enemy, but I'm sure most people would view it as a blessing. Be careful what you wish for. You just might get it. So what about reducing suffering? Well, as we've just touched upon, suffering can be the most beneficial aspect to assist in an awakening. So ironically, if we are reducing suffering, we may be doing more harm than good. Of course, not in all cases. Sometimes suffering can serve as just an equal distraction as pleasure in keeping one from negotiating illusion. So the question becomes, is the reduction of suffering enabling illusion, or is the reduction of suffering a byproduct of detachment? This is key and brings everything full circle. Morality is junk that enables delusion. And if we are walking the way of detachment, we don't need morality at all. So what are the core principles of detachment? That we do not engage in anything unto ourselves or unto others that would foster attachments or hinder the process of detachment. This, of course, means that we do not steal, murder, lie, cheat, or cause harm. Not because it's moral, good, altruistic, or ethical not to do so, but because these activities enable attachment and hinder detachment in the self and in others. And by the same token, if charity, altruism, healing, and giving pleasures to others enables attachment or hinders detachment in the self or others, it should just as equally be avoided. So this is the only question one should be asking themselves when contemplating any endeavor. Is this endeavor enabling attachment or hindering detachment in anyone, including myself? If you can answer this question honestly, you will know how to proceed. Because morality, at best, is dubious and oddly enough, has a lot of blood on its hands. Not only is it a distinctive concept that enables delusion, but a concept that invasively and intrusively gets forcibly shoved down the throat. Religion, the ultimate apex of moral standards, is responsible for more immoral behavior than anything else in history. If the pinnacle of morality inevitably becomes, accept my organized system of morality or die, then we definitely do not need morals. Because mankind's biggest struggle or life lesson is with attachments, the surrender of everything. But it's not an option or choice because sooner or later death will come and take it all away. So why not get a head start and begin preparing for this transaction? Any kind of authoritative code of conduct will not help in this preparation because the main feature of these codes is thou shall not infringe upon my attachments. And it's important to note that the art of detachment, so to speak, is a subtle practice. Some may get the idea that since fostering detachment is the primary function, 
then perhaps stealing, lying, killing, and harming could be useful in helping people detach. I can see the logic of it, but it doesn't work out that way and often has the opposite effect. If you take something from someone, it only makes them crave it more of what use is it. Detachment imposed with brute force is contrary to the purpose of detachment. It's like using a sledgehammer to swat a fly on a friend's head. The object of attachment is not the issue. The issue is that which feels compelled to attach. So this can only be handled by addressing the spirit within, not the object on the so-called outside. This is why we have such practices as selflessness and meditation. Detachment is a long, gradual process that involves unlearning and unprogramming ourselves to a condition. Having our attachments ripped from us will not accomplish the task. Death is the only one qualified to do this, but even death cannot teach it to you. Death is ultimately the moment where it is determined whether or not you have mastered attachments. If you must believe in some kind of idea of final judgment, then this is the closest that's gonna come. If you can surrender everything to death without looking back, you can move on to freedom of pure spirit. If not, then you will find yourself right back in attachment. This is really determined only by you, what's self-evident, and not on a subjective ruling or judgment by death. Death is just a gatekeeper, nothing more and the gate will only open to those who are free from attachments. Just as a balloon will only rise if it's not tethered. If a balloon is tied to a brick, where can it go? Ultimately, morality is useless. It is subjective, yes, but this doesn't mean anything either. It doesn't matter what we do, whether we are a saint or a tyrant, whether we are inflicting suffering or soothing suffering. Bottom line, if we are caught up in attachments of any type, including morality, then we are wallowing in weakness, dependency, and limitation. When we begin to get a taste of pure spirit, it becomes abundantly clear that this whole mundane, material, hedonistic game of attachments is not our full potential. A pure spirit anchored in the material is metaphorically like a rocket scientist flipping burgers in a fast food restaurant. Like an eagle that doesn't fly because it thinks it's a turkey. Like water that gives up being water to be a rock. Whether spirit became anchored in the material because of a fall from grace, so to speak, or if it because it is a natural step in a progressively evolving process, doesn't matter. This is where we are, and morals won't help us. So where do we go from here? Will we continue to linger in it, or will we progress on to broader horizons? Yes.